Good afternoon. I'm Ron Moore of Moore Gallery in Hamilton. We're in our Hess Street Gallery this afternoon uh, to spend a half an hour with uh, one of Canada's finest young artists, Paul Sloggett. Uh, we currently have an exhibition of Paul's works uh, running until December the 12th. And uh, I'll take this chance to encourage you to come to our gallery and uh, see this wonderful exhibition. It really is a tremendous exhibition of very, very exciting, colorful paintings. And uh, we certainly hope that you have a chance to uh, come down and view it. Anyways, I'll introduce you. This is uh, Paul Sloggett. And uh, Paul, what I'd like to do is spend the next half hour talking a little bit about you and your life. And uh, maybe we can start uh, back in 1950. 1950, OK. August 7th, 1950, that's when I was born. Uh, Campbellford, Ontario. Small little town along the Trent River. <coughs> and uh, my grandparents uh, still live there. Uh, and so we do have a lot of family roots still in that location. Um, it's kind of a pretty little place. And it has a nice atmosphere, having the river run right through everything. So that's where I was born, and I, I lived there briefly, but I've been back a lot of times since <coughs> since I grew up because of the family roots that we have in the area. Uh, my parents, my father's a school teacher. Uh, gets a little fed up with that, I think, teaching at a one-room schoolhouse in, uh, in the middle of nowhere. And uh, decides to move, take the family to Oshawa when the, uh, in the, during the 50s, the automotive boom was really on there in Oshawa and everybody pretty well was working for General Motors. So uh, he does that for a while, and, and it doesn't really work out. I don't think it appeals to somebody with an education at, you know, at that time. So he uh, he has a uh, he moves on from there. Uh, we live in Oshawa. My uh, <coughs> my my mother uh, at that time she starts to get interested, quite interested in um, acting, and. Um, you know, kind of being a farm girl, and it's just about as far away from her sensibilities as you could possibly get, but she's really quite flamboyant and uh, uh, gregarious sort of person, so. So she ends up taking up uh, doing some little theater work and uh, acquires, I guess, uh, or has always been interested in art. Ends up bringing home books from the library and whatnot, and so I see, start to see books from uh, French Impressionists at a really early age, and she, you know, just a kid, she says, here, have a look at these. And I look at them, I think, I really like these. And uh, they just immediately appealed to me. And um, not that I ever thought that I could do it, or it wasn't anything more than that, but I was interested right off the bat. I mean, that was like five or six years old, you know? And I can still remember it happening. So, and then, you know, as you grow up and you, you end up going to high school, you, you, you do what everybody does. I mean, I played hockey like everybody else, and uh, I, I enjoyed that. And I developed <coughs> uh, quite an interest in music, which I pursued until I was about 20 years old. And I played with uh, a lot of local bands in the area, and that time it was rock music, and it later led into playing some jazz. But um, I, I was fortunate enough in my high school years to, um, to have an, uh, an art teacher who, and I think in high school, it's really odd that you get a teacher who's a real human being. Most of them weren't. Hmm. And this guy really was. He was just a, a super person, a real, a real person. And through his art classes, I mean, I respected him as an individual, and he was really, really encouraging. And I thought, gosh, you know, like, he was probably the closest thing that I could ever come in con to, a contact with about what an artist was. Even though he was a high school teacher, he putted around on his own. But he was very influential and he was very dedicated and um, and he just, you know, he directed us in kind of uh, in the right way. I don't, he wasn't very heavy handed about what he did, you know, it wasn't something like draw like this or paint like that or you have to do this. His role, I think, was just to try to bring it out from, from within the students. And as a result, he had several people that went on to uh, later go on to the uh, Ontario College of Art. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, I, it was my, I, I, mean, I made the decision when I was about 16, 15 or 16 years old, that yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an artist. I looked around me and I saw a lot of people that were working and kind of waiting for retirement. And I thought, well, waiting for retirement to have, a, to have fun in 
wanted to have an exciting life then, and I thought, well, gosh, you know, like 60 years old, I mean, I'm like 15, seemed like an eternity, so I thought, well, geez, you know, like, there's got to be ways of having an interesting sort of life right from day one. I think at this time you were uh, interested uh, and were quite seriously looking at the Group of Seven and Absolutely. you were very strongly influenced by guys like Tom Thompson and Absolutely. that whole uh, movement. They maybe were could, real heroes. Yeah, maybe you could spend some time and talk about that. They were real heroes. I mean, uh, being a Canadian and uh, growing up, I mean, you're kind of force-fed the Group of Seven. But I liked everything that they stood for. I liked the fact that they were out in the wilderness camping, painting out, uh, painting out of doors. The subject matter that they did and everything really appealed to me. I was uh, very interested in, in, uh, in camping and canoeing and that sort of thing myself. So I ended up going up to a lot of the areas that they had painted in Algoma and Algonquin Park and whatnot and, uh, on canoe trips and, and sketching and doing work, you know, quite similar. And I, at that point, I mean, they were sort of the major influence in, uh, in, in a young career. And, and, you know, after you go to art college and everything, you learn, oh, the group of seven, oh, well, they're only, you know, these guys. But I've, I've always maintained my love of this stuff. And I still think that... Um, you know, uh, Tom Thompson is just a, a sensational painter, mm -hmm. and some of the pieces that Lauren Harris did too. I, I've, I'm quite attracted toward the uh, later abstract pieces, mm -hmm. and um, uh, initially I liked some of the more uh, serene kind of sculptured landscapes that he did, and I, I, they have a wonderful mood to them. But I, you know, I was very strongly influenced by looking at that stuff, and I liked their lifestyle and everything they stood for, right. and. Uh, so anyway, um, moving, I was accepted at the Ontario College of Art in mm -hmm. 1969, I believe it was. There were some things that happened to you prior to that time that we discussed. The, uh, I think at about 18, you were, you came in contact with the work of Richard oh, Diebenkorn, yeah. and also uh, we should maybe spend a moment talking about that, and also uh, the exhibition that Michael Snow had, had at the AGO. Right. Right. Well, the piece of Richard Diebenkorn's that I saw was probably one of the first pieces of abstract art that I'd come in contact with. And it was out of a collection that was being exhibited at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery in Oshawa. And I saw this painting and I, I felt so moved by the, I think more the application of paint, the, um, the quality of the picture, the classical sense of composition and structure, and a sense of space within the picture plane. I, I was really just really moved by this thing. And um, I like the touch, like the, uh, the application of, of, of paint that he used. So I, you know, I, uh, one, once again, I think that was uh, a real influential kind of moment, even though it was like a, a probably a, a minor exhibition of, 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 of somebody's collection. It, it was really influential. So I, I later I went on to OCA, and during my first year, there was a terrific exhibition at the uh, Art Gallery of Ontario of Michael Snow's a retrospective that he had, and I found uh, I was just really interested in his all of the perceptual plays that he was working with, and uh, it was a tremendous exhibition. And it was at that time. I mean, although my work is nothing anywhere near Michael Snow's, it's at that time that I really figure I out that. I don't want a career in advertising. I want to do something that's going to be a little bit more significant. Mm -hmm. And so I, I chose at that point to go into what was the drawing and painting department. And that was probably the luckiest thing that ever happened to me because that year that I was accepted into that department, it was my second year of OCA, Dennis Burton takes over the entire department. Dennis Burton brings in all his buddies brings in Graham Coftry, Gord Rayner, and mm -hmm. Robert Markle. Um, and he rotated at that time periods amongst a lot of the younger up-and-coming artists that were in that city, Dan Solomon, David Bolduck. He was bringing artists in from London, uh, the Rabinovich brothers, Royden and David, Ron Martin. So we, at that time, felt that we were being taught by the leading edge of the avant-garde in that city, and the energy was just fantastic. And <clears throat> I think that I was very lucky to be in second year at that time. And those guys were very benevolent and, and very helpful. They couldn't do enough. We were, all the time, we were you know, going to exhibitions that they were having. We were 
seeing them uh, socially as well. So it became like uh, a real sense of community. Mm -hmm. Several people that I went to school with in that particular year are still working, and that's you know uh, rare actually. Yeah, that's a rare right. occurrence. There's uh, Phil Richards, David Craven. Um, just to name a couple. Mm -hmm. And I think those artists are both doing really uh, significant works of art. And I know because of the influence that Dennis Burton had and uh, the teachers that he brought in, it was primarily one of the reasons why we're all still doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so You were also at one time working directly with Coffrey, I think. You were that's assisting right, him yeah. in his studio. And uh, so there was really a... Yeah. And, uh, really direct contact, not just from a teaching standpoint, but uh, you were building a friendship with these people as well. That's right. I think Graham is, uh, uh, Coffrey is one person who perhaps teaches best by kind of example. And watching him work, uh, I used to stretch canvases for him and, and prime them and whatnot, and I was at his place a lot. <coughs> I lived right across the road from him on Spadina in a studio. and. Uh, I don't know, they used to, I guess, feel sorry for me sitting over there eating sardines and whatnot. They'd invite me over for supper all the time, so. <laughs> so it was just like a second home. Who were the, at this period, during this period, uh, which is uh, uh, during the time that uh, you were involved with all these artists, who was the strongest influence on you during this early? Because, I mean, you were still only 19, maybe 20 years old at this time, right? Right. You're still quite young. Who, I are the, think, who are the artists that yeah. you were really looking at seriously? The yeah. artists that were af directly affecting your work? Okay, at OCA, at that particular time, I was really interested in Frank Stella. And pretty well, everything he did, right from the early, you know, concentric black pictures up to the more eccentric shaped ones. And I started to <coughs> really hit it in that direction, being very interested in a more sculptural approach to painting, a, a painting that was somewhat of a hybrid between. Uh, painting and sculpture. And that was a stance that I took at a, a very early kind of age and stuck with it. I mm -hmm. think it's just part of my sensibility uh, that I've been working with all the way along. Uh, the, uh, after uh, uh, I graduated from the college, I was, uh, the earlier pictures that I was doing, I was very influenced at that time by looking at other sculptors and not so much painters, but looking at people like, uh, oh gee, <coughs> you know, I was really into David Smith, for example, uh, Mark de Suvero, uh, American constructivist sculptors, mm -hmm. I was really interested in that. And also, that led me to, to gain interest too in uh, Cubism. Uh, Leo Gonzalez's uh, uh, sculpture as well was really influential. Mm -hmm. So, I, I had a feeling then that when I wasn't so much painting a picture as I was building a painting. Right. And it's something that's really stuck with me all the way along. Mm -hmm. Well, your work has certainly changed over the years. Your, your uh, direct involvement living on uh, Spadina and Dundas and the connection with Coftry and Rayner, I mean, that must have been uh, very influential, especially at a young age. Um, you continued to live in Toronto uh, after you were married. And uh, I think that um, your association with David Balduk at that time really uh, yeah. was important to you. Absolutely. And once again, I think it got lucky. Just heading into the subway, I remember the day. I was heading into the subway right in front of the uh, Royal Ontario Museum. David's coming out of the subway. And I had met David earlier. As I mentioned, he was one of the teachers that we'd had, uh, that Dennis had brought in. He was a very young artist then, and he'd just come back from Afghanistan. And he invited us up to the studio at that time, and we'd seen pictures that he was working on, and I really thought he was something else. And um, anyway, he, uh, at that point, was looking for someone else to share a studio space. He was sharing a studio with another artist and uh, who and later died, unfortunately, uh, David Watson, a right. young, very talented guy. and. Uh, so the, the spot kind of opened up in the studio, and so David and I were there sharing it, the two of us ourselves. And w I feel I was really lucky because David was older than I was. He was a bit more established. I mean, he was a lot more established. And uh, so he had a constant kind of stream of really uh, interesting people coming over, and people who 
were really well connected in the art world. I mean, it was one person after another. We'd, we'd have, uh, you know, artist curator Kieran Wilkin would be there one day. The next day, you'd have Jack Bush, you know, coming over to look at pictures, and it was just fantastic. We had people from David had a lot of people gravitate toward the studio, and um, he has a lot of really varied uh, interests as well. So we had everybody from Oriental rug dealers popping in there all the time, drawing. Yeah, is that right? He's a phenomenal collection of Oriental rugs, and he's quite the scholar in the field. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> and uh, from everybody from Oriental rugs to whale noises, you know, recorded whale noises, and huh. uh, so the people we had through the studio were so interesting. I mean, it was really an education in itself. This was uh, really a pivotal point, I think, in uh, in your career. In Absolutely. that uh, You were very fortunate at 25 years old to come in contact with not just Jack Bush but David Mervish. That's right. Maybe you'd like to spend some time and talk about that. Uh, a friend of, of David's, uh, David Bolduc, was Alcas Clonaritas, and um, he was the manager of the David Mervish Gallery at that point. And so he used to be overseeing David's paintings quite often. David himself was between galleries at that point, and um, he uh, he was doing a lot of pictures, and they were kind of they were just starting to evolve into the paintings that have the images in the central portion mm -hmm. of the grounds. Alcas used to come over all the time. And finally David said, you know, to Alcas, gee, you should take a look at this guy's pictures too. He's doing some really hot stuff. And he, me. So I start showing Alcas pictures and Alcas says, geez, yeah, these aren't too bad. Uh, maybe uh, I can set up a, a meeting for uh, David Mervish to come down here. Now by and by that eventually took place. and. I almost thought I'd missed my chance because David got ill and he had to go in the hospital. But, and I thought, oh, it's, they're going to forget about it for sure. But they didn't. He comes back about a month later, comes to the studio. I mean, this is somebody that's showing some of the most important artists in the world, right? He's got Frank Stella, Robert Motherwell, Jules Lewitsky. I mean, that the list just went on and on and on. Frank and Thaler, Lewis, you know. And <clears throat> these were... I mean, international heroes, right? So, and there I was, this Canadian kid, and Mervish comes in, looks at the work and says, uh, do you have a dealer at this point? And I said, no. He says, how would you like to be represented by my gallery? And I mean, it was just unbelievable. You know, it was, uh, it, it was quite a moment. <clears throat> so, I, so I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, well, I said yes, of course. And they ended up showing with the likes of Jack Bush. And uh, at that point, David uh, Mervish was taking on several other Canadians, Paul Fournier, Kay Graham, uh, Millie Risfit, David Bolduck, Eric Gamble. And we, uh, we started having exhibitions there together. And I, I felt really honored and I felt like I was a little bit uh, out of my league. It's kind of like it happened a little bit prematurely and I hadn't quite paid all my dues. Um, but I feel like I've paid them now. <laughs> okay. The, uh, when you're talking about your track record, of course, your uh, reputation has grown over the years and uh, the quality of your painting is certainly uh, tremendous. What I'd like you to talk about a little bit is your, your American uh, exposure. You did a show called 14 Canadians, organized by Andrew Hudson in the U.S. Maybe you could start with that and talk a little bit about your exposure in the States. All right. That was, uh, again, another lucky moment. And uh, a critic, Andrew Hudson, came to Canada, traveled all across the country, and selected 14 people to represent Canada uh, at an exhibition that was going to be held at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C. And that uh, the people that, once again, uh, I believe I was one of the youngest artists to be included in the exhibition. And they took quite a survey. They took, I mean, it, it went from everybody, oh uh, gosh, you know, the, the age groups were just really quite fantastic. Unfortunately, prior to the exhibition, Jack Bush had died. This uh, was in 1977, I believe. And uh, <coughs> he had passed away, oh, I think maybe just only a month before the show had opened. And he was one of the people that were, of course, in the exhibition. 
Um, and in, in ages, I guess it varied from myself to uh, Jean-Paul Lemieux. Um, and I felt, once again, that was a, a tremendous kind of um, burst of energy and uh, a tremendous thing to have happen to you. I had you know, kind of international or national outside Canada exposure anyway. And at that time that the exhibition was on at the Hirshhorn Museum, four, four of the painters were asked to exhibit at a private gallery, the Diane Brown Gallery. And uh, we had a, a, a small private exhibition at the same time, which really went very well for me. Uh, I think we, uh, we sold out the entire show within uh, a matter of a day. So it was quite outstanding. I, uh, which prompted her to ask me to send down a, another shipload of paintings. Well, it takes a long time to paint a picture, and I'm not going to be rushed into it. I want to take my time, and I want to make sure that the quality is there. So I poured over them, poured over them, got them together, sent them down. Lucky enough, she was able to uh, do her magic. And uh, so at that time, there had been a, an art dealer from California who was visiting Washington, saw my exhibition, and liked my exhibition, and wanted to have an exhibition of my paintings in California. So here I was, I mean, at the, the ripe old age of 28, having my second one-man show in the United States. Uh, it sold out as well. Uh, and I, I hadn't even had a show in Toronto yet. Hmm. And painting Amazing. Toronto, yeah. So uh, it's kind of strange the way things happened or the way things got going. But the American audience was really quite positive towards the work, which uh, gave me a lot of encouragement as well. So uh, right after that, uh, the David Mervish Gallery closed down. And uh, Alka's Klonaritis, his manager, opened up a, a gallery. And I've been with Alka's in Toronto since. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's, it's been, uh, I've had much better kind of uh, action and uh, criticism coming from the States than I have from Canada. Fortunately, I just recently received my first positive review in Canada, so I still think there's some hope. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, a lot, of it, uh, a lot of artists have established themselves outside the country before they've really made a hit in Canada anyways. This has sort of been the trend. Yeah, I guess so. It seems so. to have a right Jack Bush for an example. Riopelle did the same thing. Riopelle did the same thing. He went outside thing. Canada and then came back. That's so right. The, uh, maybe th this show in Washington, was it called Four Toronto Painters? Was That's that? right. Four Toronto Painters. Right. It was David Bolduck, Paul Fournier, Kay Graham, and myself. Oh, that's great. That's great. Now, you spent some time in Europe not long after that. You were telling yes. me that you, in 1977, got away for a six-week trip. That's right. And that was uh, quite influential as well Absolutely. in regard to your your work? Well, up till that time, you know, uh, being in this country and, uh, you know, having the AGO is kind of the standard of where you can go and see things. If you live in Toronto, uh, you rarely get to see anything of any real international quality. So seeing pictures like Velasquez and, and Matisse and, and Cezanne and seeing uh, seeing the Impressionists. I, I had the opportunity to go to, to France, go to Louvre, Jeux de Pomme, the Orangerie, and Rodin Museum, and it was spectacular. All the things I've been looking at in books I've seen for the first time in real life, and it was great. So from France, we went to Italy. I toured through Florence and, and Rome, and at that same time, I had, I had a small exhibition in Bologna, Italy. And from there, we went down and spent a little time kind of relaxing after that barrage of cities in Greece. And uh, I did, that's when I first started to do watercolors kind of on site, so to speak, and letting kind of, oh, just, you know, the, the surroundings really influence what it is that you do. So ever since then, every location, every time I've gone away, uh, anywhere, I take watercolors and make small sketches, and they generally uh, initiate or generate larger paintings in the studio when I get back. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, I, I think we're slowly running out of time here, but uh, maybe we should spend some time and talk about this exhibition. There, there's a, a, a range of work from the shaped canvases to the more recent things. We have a painting back from 1976 in this exhibition. 
uh, maybe you could spend some time, pick out a painting and talk about your, uh, what you're doing today and maybe the influences and right. give us a little more of a feeling of, of you and uh, your work. Once again, I, I think that um, I, I, I still think of myself as building a painting and so uh, sculpture really comes into making paintings for me. And the sculptural kind of additives that uh, I've incorporated into the pictures, I think are absolutely necessary. I'm just not convinced myself anyway that I can do what I want to do strictly illusionistically. So I've taken the liberty of building up, you know, collage, uh, wood elements that are in relief to the picture, a lot of texture, you know, that's in the painting. And, and of course, I really do have an interest in color, color and paint application. And I think that, um, you know, like, I, I find that my interests have evolved and that uh, the interests probably of a mid-career painter are much different than the interests of a, a painter initiating his career and likely much different than a, a painter in, uh, toward the end of his career. And I'm finding right now that I spend a lot of time looking at really some really classical works of art, uh, everything from, you know, Matisse to Degas to uh, um, Velasquez, Piero della Francesca, and often I'll, I'll reinterpret what I see in those paintings in my paintings. For example, this painting here, the, the color in the background uh, comes directly out of Bonnard. And I look at those paintings and I really like those paintings. And uh, they excite me and they excite me to kind of want to do something about it too. And I don't think of it as in a plagiaristic way, but kind of like um, a homage. So in this particular picture here, uh, I called it Bonnard, and it come from, came from looking at his pictures for a couple of months. I spent a lot of time looking at pictures of Matisse, and you can take a painting like this, for example, that's really heavily influenced by the kind of color composition and the directness, mm -hmm. the kind of paint application and everything that Matisse used. Um, I think that <coughs> if I have anything to say is that I, I really do uh, enjoy looking at historical pieces of art. And I think there's an amazing amount of information to be learned. And, and how I judge a painting to be good myself mm -hmm. is a painting that I can learn something from, something a painting that teaches me something. Something new, in other words. Absolutely. Well, on that point, I'd... Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Paul, very You're much. Most welcome. And uh, I'd certainly like to encourage you again to come and see this exhibition. It's uh, it's visually just a phenomenal show. The colors are wonderful. The the uh, it's a very very high quality show. And uh, I hope that the people that are viewing this uh, interview will take a chance and take the time to come down and see it. And uh, we thank you very much for uh, coming and uh, visiting us today. Thank you.